What you doing? Hey, just finishing this claim to get Dave back on the road. Nice. I wonder what Dave's doing. We've got you covered. Hey, is the power off on this? I don't know. Just take it off. Safety violation. Unsafe work conditions. In the construction trades unions, safety is our highest priority, and we train you to recognize and speak out on unsafe working conditions so that everyone arrives and goes home safely. Learn about careers in construction at georgiaconstructioncareers.com. Good afternoon and welcome to the 345th episode of the Alpha Insurance Georgia Prep Sports Drive for the GHSA State Title. Today we're going to talk more about recruiting than we have in recent shows. There's a lot of big news um, over the weekend. A lot of guys flipping from Georgia to other schools, so we'll break that down. We have a lot of stories up on it right now at scoreatl.com. We'll talk about some of the big uh, lacrosse results over the weekend. Uh, there's only three weeks left of the regular season, and there's a big matchup tomorrow with West Forsyth and Lambert, a rematch of last year's 7A state finals. And Lambert actually just served Buford its first loss of the season. And why is that significant? Well, in Class 7A, there's only four areas, and actually Buford is in the same area as West Forsyth and Lambert. So we'll see how the region or area standings are going to shake out. Got some track and field news and some baseball as well. But let's start with the big recruiting news. And we'll start with a player out of Peachtree Ridge. This is Miles Abernathy. He was their top receiver last year, and Peachtree Ridge was – if you looked at the calculation on win totals and points per game, they were the most improved team in all of 7A. They have a lot going on over there uh, with Matt Hilmerick. He came over from Johns Creek. Uh, Roddy White's son's there now. They are really uh, building a competitive program. And Miles Abernathy was their top target last year. He only played in 10 games. He got hurt uh, in the final regular season game and as you know Peachtree Ridge shared a region championship with Norcross and North Gwinnett uh, they beat North Gwinnett they lost to Norcross and ended up getting a tough seed in the playoffs they beat Lambert and then fell to Mill Creek in the next round Miles Abernathy was out both those games and uh, it really hurt them just with their offensive production in the 10 games he played last year he had 12 touchdowns uh, came up huge in the loss to Norcross, actually, when he was battling the injury. Had a season-high 10 catches, 153 yards, and a touchdown. And so that's the type of impact he can make uh, for the Lions. I think he's going to be one of the best receivers in the entire state next year, and he just committed to Liberty. And Liberty did a good job of uh, recruiting out of the state of Georgia last year. They got Devin Henderson from Cass. Uh, one of the best utility um, two-way players we saw last season. Uh, he came up huge for the Colonels. Uh, so let's look at this commitment real quick. And what I love about uh, the story, it's up on uh, the Gwinnett Post. It shows Miles Abernathy in the North Gwinnett game uh, hauling in a touchdown. and He's not even wearing gloves. This is the first time I've seen a receiver in the last few years, uh, especially one of his caliber that plays without gloves. So that's how confident uh, he is with his hands. So let's look at it right here. All right, Peachtree Ridge senior Miles Abernathy committed Sunday to Liberty University. He's six foot four, 200 pounds. He was first team all county, all region selection last year for the Lions state playoff team. He had 46 catches for 677 yards and 12 touchdowns as a senior. And when you look at Coach Helmrich and his track record, when he was at Johns Creek, he had a receiver named Josh Thompson, one of the fastest guys 
uh, in the state and explosive receivers, he's not afraid um, if one of his receivers gets hot to just go to him. That's what you saw in some of these games last year uh, with Miles Abernathy. So just to look at his impact uh, against Loganville last year, he had five catches for three touchdowns. He had a touchdown in every single game except the Duluth one. And that was a 42-7 victory last game of the regular season and that was the game he got hurt in still had three catches for 51 yards put up massive numbers against uh, North Gwinnett in the 27-17 victory three catches for 74 yards and two touchdowns so Darnell Kelly's only going to be a junior but Miles Ab Abernathy is going to be his top target he's committed to uh, Liberty now he's happy with that decision and we'll see if he sticks with it uh, but that's a great get for the Flames. All right, the other big recruiting news, and it actually is shaking up to be a very interesting trend, was the flip from Justice Terry when he committed to the USC Trojans. Uh, this came a week after Tay Harris, Cedartown's safety, um, and a longtime UGA commit, he also flipped uh, his decision uh, last week so when you look at this top um, top rankings for the class of 2024 in the state of Georgia USC is actually killing it right now they have the number two overall player Justice Terry the number three with Julian Lewis and then Isaiah Gibson right as Justice Terry flipped to Georgia he's another defensive lineman from Warner Robins, six foot four, two hundred forty-five pounds, he committed to the Trojans over the weekend. Uh, so that is this is big news, and I think it is connected. You have two of the top defensive linemen in the state now committing pretty much the same week to USC. Uh, so there's a lot of talk. There's not too much panic uh, from the Bulldogs, um, but that is a big deal. And I think to add little insult to injury it is Tay Harris um, deciding to go to Clemson I think the move does make sense Georgia is loaded at its sec secondary especially the safety position uh, they got KJ Bolden uh, from Buford last year probably the number one athlete and playmaker in the state last season uh, so I think Tay Harris he's looking at Clemson with their trend of playing young guys I think he's going to be an early enrollee and he's gonna get up ready to roll at Clemson. So I made the comparison last week with Tay Harris to KJ Bolden because I think they play a very similar role with their teams. KJ Bolden was able to step in at receiver, step in at running back, and then obviously uh, special teams. He had the big kickoff return for a touchdown in the playoff game against Grayson, opening kickoff. And then Tay Harris is the same way. He's going to be the return man. He's going to be on offense making plays for Cedartown, and he's going to be in that secondary. We saw him in the Georgia Elite Classic. No one wanted to throw his way, and he's just one of those players where once the ball's in his hands, he's going to do something special. Uh, he can make guys miss in the open field, and you can see the offense and defensive skill sets come together. Uh, he's the best player on the field, and so that's another – a tough one for Georgia and one of the recent flips we've seen. But let's dive deeper into this Justice Terry news. Because uh, if you watched last season, he's been a huge part of uh, the storyline. He's a multi year starter for Manchester. He's led them deep in the playoffs year in and year out. Uh, they made it to the finals last year. They ended up falling short in a toss-up game to Bowden, a team they beat in the regular season in region play. And it was no fault to him. He played outstanding. He was the biggest guy on the field. Uh, he stood out, passes the eye test. I call him a first-off-the-bus type of guy where you just see Manchester coming on the field and you know that that guy's special. He already has the physical gifts. And so... There is talk on what does this mean um, for Kirby Smart and will he remain aggressive 
and try to get him back. That's how valuable of a player he is. Uh, so this came out over the weekend. It says, Justice Terry Flip to USC only further validates Kirby Smart's stance on NIL and recruiting. Uh, so they are tying this into recent statements from Kirby Smart where he has been critical um, of NIL and its impact on college football. And maybe uh, USC is um, offering a different opportunity for players, and that's why we're seeing uh, more of them um, commit there. So after a day like Sunday on the recruiting trail, you can understand why Kirby Smart vented about the frustrations he has when it comes to recruiting, NIL, and development. There's a lot of them that want to talk about or ask about NIL. Smart said this earlier this month. They don't want to ask about what your NFL players have done. I think it's much more important how you develop players than how much NIL you make. And that is certainly a strong argument for Kirby Smart. Uh, in the past, Georgia had this uh, criticism, actually. They say, how come Georgia has the top um, top recruiting classes in the country every year? How come they're producing so many um, NFL prospects, but they aren't winning national titles? Well, Kirby Smart delivered that. Georgia obviously won two national titles, and they're still putting tons of players into the NFL. So he's saying it's not just about the money. It's about going to a place like Georgia where you can uh, develop and really get that money um, at the NFI, it, sorry, NFL level after a successful career. And so he's viewing it more as like a long-term investment in your um yeah, in your career. So uh, that came on Sunday. The Bulldogs have had four defensive linemen taken in the first round of the last two drafts. USC has just had one defensive player drafted in the first round since Smart became Georgia's head coach back in 2016. And anyone with a slight clue of how USC's defense played last year, uh, you would understand that they are in desperate need of some big time playmakers. Terry wasn't the only major Georgia recruit uh, target to commit to USC on Sunday. Four-star outside linebacker Isaiah Gibson joined Terry in USC's class. Both players are from the state of Georgia, with Terry hailing from Manchester and Gibson being a Warner Robins native. And so the news with Isaiah came the same day. Uh, the Trojans also hold a commitment from five-star Quarterback Juju Lewis giving Lincoln Riley's team three of the top eight players in the state of Georgia. As bad as yesterday was on the recruiting trail for Georgia, there's still plenty of time for the Bulldogs to recover and possibly even land Terry M. Gibson and keep them back in uh, the state of Georgia. And they uh, mentioned K.J. Bolden because he was a guy that they were able to convince late uh, to commit. He was initially committed to Florida State. Uh, he had a big signing party uh, week one of the season uh, with what we thought was going to be his future teammate. Uh, Luke Cromenhawk, the Benedictine quarterback, was actually there. It's one of the biggest uh, signing celebrations I've seen um, for, or commitment uh, parties I've seen. Uh, but ultimately he flipped. Uh, this wouldn't be the first time that Georgia has seen USC earned early enrollment from an elite player uh, from the Peach State in the 2022 recruiting cycle. Michael Williams from Hardaway initially committed to USC and then decided to go to Georgia. And this is a make or break year for Michael Williams. Uh, he is one of the most uh, gifted players on that Georgia defense, um, but they are waiting for him to have that all SEC type season. And we've certainly seen him get it done. Uh, he played in our Georgia League class, Classic as a sophomore, and I believe as a freshman as well. Um, but let's see. Basically, with my game this year, I'm basically trying to improve my hands, uh, hand speed, pad level, and get off. So I think what you can take away from this, Kirby is taking a strong uh, stance on the NIL. 
but I think they are really going all in on this hey, development argument. And when you look at the guys that have gotten to campus um, this last right. spring that we're going to see in the G-Day coming up in a week or two, it's the attention to detail, especially with the offensive linemen. Um, guys like Daniel Calhoun, uh, guys across the board that came in tipping the scales at like 380 pounds, they're getting these guys leaned out and ready to play. So I think they're seeing the crazy college landscape right now with all the NIL stuff, transfer portal, and they're really going all in to making sure they're developing the players as much as possible. So I think that's the trend. We'll see how it plays out, but certainly an interesting weekend. And when you see USC all over the top of the um, in-state rankings, that is a very interesting development. So let's look at some of the other uh, commitments over the weekend. All right, let's run through this list real quick. All right, yeah, Luke Metz from Mill Creek. Uh, he is one of the uh, premier defen defensive players for the Hawks. He is going to be a three-year starter um, this upcoming season. He's one of the MVPs of last year's team, reliable, physically built, uh, played in that state championship game against Carrollton two years ago. He committed to Alabama. He is ranked the number 52 overall player in the state. And he is a three-star, so that is a big get for Alabama. Then you have, let's look at some of the other Georgia guys. Uh, Marshall uh, Pritchett, tied in, six foot five from Raven Gap, committed to UNC. You have Zachary Harden from Newton, committing to Minnesota. He is a cornerback. Uh, Newton is a team that is, I think can compete for. Uh, home field this upcoming season. They're, they're going to have Grayson, Archer, Brookwood, South Gwinnett, but Newton has um, played all those teams very tough, and we saw what they did last season. And then you have uh, yeah, Dodge County. We mentioned him, Daryl Johnson. We've got a nice story up on Score ATL with more details on that commitment that came late last week. And then you have Demarcus Gardner. That's Tay Harris's Cedartown teammate he committed to UCF um, that was on I think last Thursday same day as Tay Harris flipping committing to Clemson you have Woodward Academy's Jerome Bittis Jr. Uh, the son of the bus he committed to Notre Dame last week he's a wide receiver six foot two 190 pounds and uh, uh, Tavares Dice from Langston Hughes, offensive tackle, committed to Auburn. So it has been a busy week. It really does seem like it is a year around a recruiting cycle these days. Uh, lots of news breaking, um, but we will see uh, who ends up coming out on top. There are still a lot of great uncommitted players. You got Elijah Griffin. Now that Justice Terry's gone, he's a defensive lineman. Georgia is uh, among his top favorites. You got Zayden Walker, linebacker from Sly County. And then some other big time defensive prospects, Tavian Wallace and Kevin Wynn, all in the top 10. And then another player, Antoine Hill, that we're going to see in the Corky Kell Classic against Alpharetta, the six foot five quarterback. He is certainly one to watch for. All right, so that is it for the recruiting. We've got a lot of stories up on scoretail.com with Max, Najee, Hayden all um, putting down the brakes. All right. So let's get into this Buford result this weekend, and then we'll hit the break. But first, let's just talk about it. So. Lambert seems to have Buford's number. Uh, Buford is trying to establish its lacrosse program. They've been a team that is always making the playoffs, but it is really tough to um, 
play with these teams like Lambert that have been the premier program in the state of Georgia for over a decade. Last year, they really made noise. Uh, they started the season, I think they were 15-2, and two, ended up, they beat West Forsyth, the eventual state champs, 13-10, to 10, but then fell to Lambert uh, two days later. They ended up winning nine straight after that, and then they lost the rematch to West Forsyth in the quarterfinals 11 to 10. So that's how close Buford was last year. Uh, this year, they opened the season 12 and 0, and then they hosted Lambert. This was on Friday, and they fell 15 to 13. Uh, so last year, the West Forsyth game came right before the Lambert game. So they Buford beats West Forsyth, huge win for them. Then they fall to Lambert. Now, they played Lambert first, they lost, but then they're going to be at West Forsyth on April 12th. So they have time, and they still have a chance to get back into uh, the running uh, for the area title and the top seed. And it is very important because Area 6 last year, um, sorry, Area 4, the way that Class 7A works in lacrosse it's not like the other sports where there's eight regions and four teams from each region get into the playoffs, the top four seeds. There's only four areas, so the top six get in. Uh, so their chances of making the playoffs aren't hurt by this. But last year, Area 4 swept the first round of the playoffs. All of the teams won. Uh, South Forsyth actually ended up getting the number six seed out of Area uh, 4, and they beat Walton in the second round after Walton's bye. So that's how deep this area is. And then they ended up sweeping their way to the semifinals and completely filling it with West Forsyth, uh, Lambert, um, Buford, and I believe Milton. So this has been the premier region. It is the deepest. And we'll talk about it on the other side, but let's first thank our sponsors real quick. Hey, does it matter if this leaks? It don't matter to me, can't see it from my house. Illegal use of hands and proper training. GeorgiaConstructionCareers.com has 14 different highly skilled trades with tuition free training in our certified apprenticeship programs to train you the right way. Find your career at GeorgiaConstructionCareers.com. All right, welcome back. So let's, I'm gonna pull up this lacrosse real quick and break down the different areas. All right, so there will be three divisions. Uh, there's the class 7A, class 5A to 6A, and then class A through 4A. And each division is completely different in how it um, fills the playoff brackets. In Class 7A, there are 36 total schools. You'll have the top six from each area get in. The top two seeds end up getting a bye. And um, this started two years ago for lacrosse. All the seeding is determined by an ad hoc committee. That's another thing that is unique just to lacrosse across the board. So that's for 7A. In Class 5A to 6A, there are eight areas. They're going to take the top four teams in each area. And then in Class A through 4A, there are eight areas, but they do it a little different. They have at-large teams that get in that are um, voted in by an ad hoc committee. So 7A makes sense because there's not eight areas, but with those other ones, there are definitely certain areas that are top-heavy where they'll have four teams in the top 10 in the same area. And so what that ad hoc committee does, looks at the strength of schedule, and you will see teams that might be number five in their respective area still get into the playoffs uh, just based off um, evaluation and strength of schedule. So none of the um, seeds are guaranteed in lacrosse. But getting these big wins and finishing at the top, it is, uh, especially in 7A, you're going to get that uh, crucial first round bye. 
All right, so in uh, class 7A, so in area four, you have Buford, uh, Versailles Central, Denmark, Lambert, Milton, Mill Creek, North Gwinnett, Peachtree Ridge, South Forsyth, and West Forsyth. So that's how loaded that one is. Uh, they swept last year in the first round, and you very well could see that happen again. So I'm going to pull up last year's bracket real quick. All right, so South Forsyth, the sixth seed, they ended up getting all the way to the semifinals before they fell to Lambert by one goal. This is the number two seed out of area four against the six, one goal game. Then on the other side of the bracket in the semis, you had West Forsyth and Buford matching up in the semifinals. That was a one score game, 11 to 10. And then the championship, 11 to nine, West Forsyth swept uh, Lambert for the title. They became the first team in state history, first boys team to score 10 plus goals on Lambert twice. And they had previously matched up 20 times. They never once scored 10 goals. So that was West Forsyth's best ever season. Uh, but now you're seeing Lambert um, after really uh, getting um, dethroned for the first time last season by a rival that they had never lost to. Um, they are coming for it this year, and the win over uh, Buford sets up some big matchups this week. So tomorrow night you're going to have, um, that will be West Forsyth against Lambert. As we mentioned, that's a rematch of last year's state championship. It comes on the heels of uh, Lambert who was ranked number four, beating the number one ranked um, Buford Wolves. And then how this impacts the rest of Class 7A. Um, Walton, I think they were number three in the overall rankings last week. Their only loss was to Buford. They lost 13 to nine early on in the season. Uh, so, and then they beat South Forsyth 19 to 6. And they have been on a roll. They also beat West Forsyth 8 to 5. So their next big matchups, this is Walton's schedule. They only have four games left. Marietta, Cherokee, North Paulding, and Wheeler. That could guarantee them the number one seed. And once again, their only loss has come to Buford. So I think 7A doesn't necessarily go through area four, but we want to see how does Lambert respond. Are they going to avenge last year's loss to West Forsyth? And I think the win over Buford has definitely um, put some wind in their sails and given them a lot of confidence. Um, we'll see how Buford responds to that as well. They don't play West Forsyth until April 12th. All right, on the girls' side, um, Blessed Trinity was actually number four in the entire country. Um, but they just suffered their first loss as well, and that was to Cambridge, 14-13. to 13. So now Cambridge remains undefeated in Area 5. Uh, BT's 10-1. and one. They have that one loss. <clears throat> and then you have Shambly. They're still undefeated, but they've only played two region games, and Cambridge has already played five. So Cambridge has a three-game lead right now. They've already beaten uh, the top-ranked team in their region and let's see who they play next and then they catapulted to number 20 nationally and their only loss was to 7a uh, west forsyth in overtime uh, last tuesday no actually that's last thursday so they will play mill creek harrison and then at milton that'll be non-region but it will be a game worth circling Milton has not lost an in-state game in, I think, five years. So you have Cambridge, who just proved it can beat Blessed, Trin Blessed Trinity, number four team in the nation. They'll have a key matchup right before the playoffs against Milton. So that'll be another one to circle. All right, one sec. Let me pull up these rankings real quick. 
All right, and so here's how it might shake out this week. So before this, um, before the Buford loss, Buford was one, Lambert was four, yet West Forsyth the number five. So Lambert will move up, but then they're going to play West Forsyth tomorrow night. That will impact the rankings. Walton's at three. North Paulding still undefeated at number two. Walton has North Paulding on its schedule. That's the last top ten uh, matchup for them. They've already beaten West Forsyth and many more on that top ten. In Class 5A to 6A, uh, North Forsyth on the boys' side is number one. Uh, above Roswell and Lassiter. And Roswell is the defending state champ. They have had some tough outings, including the big loss to Walton. And then in Class A, 4A, you got East Forsyth, a three-year-old school. They're at number one, um, but you got Stars Mill, Fellowship Christian, and Whitewater nipping on their heels. In Class 7A girls, Milton's still undefeated. Um, they are leading North Paulding, South Forsyth. Then you got um, West Forsyth, Brookwood, and Walton in that top 10. BT remains number one. Uh, despite their one loss, Cambridge has two losses. They're at number three. And you got River Ridge at number two, undefeated at this point at 11 and 0. And then the Fellowship Christian Girls lead Class A, 4A. But yeah, the big one tomorrow night. Uh, West Forsyth and Lambert, and then the rankings will come out the next morning. So be sure to tune in to that, and you'll get the updates right there. All right, so let's look at real quick. All right, let's talk about the Grayson girls as they gear up for the Chipotle Nationals. All right, so Grayson's storybook season isn't over just yet. Uh, just four days removed from winning the Class 7A state championship in what was one of the most dominant seasons in the history of Georgia basketball, uh, they were rewarded with a champion, sorry, an invitation to the Chipotle Nationals. They will be one of the six teams uh, to play for the national championship in Brownsburg, Indiana. That will tip off April 4th through 6th. The Rams are the lone public school in that six-team field. That is a very... Uh, interesting dynamic. So only Georgia team and the only public one. Grayson head coach Tim Slater, who helped guide the Rams to the first state championship and an undefeated season earlier this month, <clears throat> said that this was the goal his team had set for themselves months ago. We're the only representative from Georgia, so to represent Georgia in generally, it, sorry, in general, <clears throat> is really neat for us. The girls had the goal of being on that national stage and wanted to create a national brand. So to accomplish that goal is great and we're really excited. In order to get the get into the conversation about being one of the nation's best teams, it took a 73 to 56 win over IMG Academy back on January 13th to really put them on the map. The win propelled the Rams into the Max Preps top 25 and they've since risen all the way up to number four in the national rankings after winning their state title. For the upcoming national tournament, the Rams were given the number two seed, and they will play the winner of IMG Academy and Grace Christian, which could set up a rematch against the Ascenders in the semifinals. Truthfully, we're really thankful for IMG Academy, Slater said. They didn't have to play us that first time. Them playing us and giving us that opportunity is really what propelled us onto the national stage and got us into the rankings. We're not going to sneak up on them this time. They're going to know who we are, and we will be out for bud. Sorry, they will be out for bud. Uh, we're really excited about the opportunity to compete. Representing the only public school in the tournament, Slater said it's something that they're not taking lightly. That's another honor. As we go into the tournament as the underdog, and the only public school getting to represent a lot of people that normally don't get this opportunity. We get to be that underdog and we're going to play up to it. We're going to go out there and compete. As a reward for being selected to play in the tournament, all expenses have been covered by the tournament sponsor, Chipotle, who took over the naming rights this year. Chipotle stepped up and took over the naming rights and they've been phenomenal, Slater said. 
it's all expenses paid they really just want us there so that's a huge relief especially for the high schools uh, to have to come to not have to come out of pocket to go there that's tremendous that they're spending that much time and money so it's all going to take place April 4th through the 6th so they get that by so I guess they only have to win two games to become national champs the Rams ascension from middle of the pack in Class 7A last year to one of the nation's best team has been nothing short of tremendous. As you know, they lost to North Paulding last year by a point. They beat them by 30 points in the regular season and then swept them in that championship game. Uh, with the addition of three transfers in Daniel Carnegie, Malaya Jones, and Taj Hunter, paired up with two homegrown players, Aaron Rodgers and Tatum Brown. Slater said this run was a result of hard work and dedication last year when adversity struck. The buildup for this year started last year when Aaron Rodgers, one of the homegrown players, tore her ACL. Tatum had to step up and carry the load. She went from being a freshman to a sophomore carrying so much uh, with so much pressure. All of this comes from the first year when Aaron went down and those kids busting their tails to put them in this position. A lot of people just see the end result. They see 32 and nothing. They see, or 32 no, they see the state title. They don't see last year where I had two play, players thrown into the fire because of injuries. They don't see that struggle and that growth. That is what has made this year so special. After receiving a first round bye as a result of the number two seeding, the Rams will take the court for the first time in the semis on April 5th. Their game, along with all the others, will be aired across all ESPN platforms. So we haven't talked about the details yet, but definitely put that on the calendar if you haven't gotten to watch Grayson play this year. They are a truly complete team. Daniel Carnegie is an absolute beast. Uh, they've got a lot of special players, and um, they have a chance to complete a perfect season and do it in the biggest way possible they already beat img academy once so i think the confidence is is off the roof uh, for them so shout out to the rams and be sure to watch that all right so let's look at some other big time performances over this weekend all right so pope had another big series win um, on the diamond, and that was Nick Brabowski. He pitched a complete game shutout and struck out seven in the nightcap to help Pope win a tough 2 nothing victory against Alpharetta. It was a big Region 7 matchup. And so something I haven't seen much this season is one guy get the complete game and shutout. And so I'll certainly put him on the map. Carter Jokum hit, had a hit and drove in both runs in the win, while teammate Andrew Nelms went two for three at the plate. In game one, that was a 12 to two win by Pope. Bryce Chapman had two hits, three RBIs. Tanner Minot was two of three for two RBIs, and then Nelms and Drew Abney each had a hit and an RBI. This is another big win uh, for a Cobb County school. All right, Kennesaw Mountain. Uh, they bounced back um, and then beat Wheeler in nine innings. So another tough loss for Wheeler. Mentioned um, they had just lost to Osborne, resulting in Osborne's first uh, series win for their baseball program. I think it was at least 17 years. Um, but that was Isender. Hovitan, he had two homers in the win to propel Kennesaw Mountain to a 7-6 extra innings win over Wheeler. He also tripled, drove in four runs, and was responsible for that nail-biter. Peter Jerzenak was 2-5 of five with a double in RBI. Garrett Barlett and George Lutz each had two hits. Austin Carter had a double and an RBI. Tyson Harmon pitched three hitless innings and struck out four in relief to earn the win. Um, and they will carry on. So that keeps Kennesaw Mountain's playoff chances alive. Obviously, you got North Cobb playing well. 
and then Walton also in that conversation. So that is a good spot to pick up. Let's hit the break, and we're going to talk about what the baseball rankings are going to look like this week when we get back on the other side. Dang, where you get this car? You need to join the union. The union? Absolutely. You can get 10 of these. Union construction workers earn the highest wages with the best benefits and the most protection in the construction industry. Find your career in construction. Go to georgiaconstructioncareers.com and start your future today. All right, welcome back. So let's start at Class 7A. And as you can guess, the two teams that really are leading the pack this season it's once again it's Parkview and Lowndes they matched up in last year's state finals they're both nationally ranked um, and we could see them on a collision course once again so Lowndes because they won last year's title they actually open the season number one in a lot of polls they ended up falling to Houston County in their opener but then they beat them a couple days later so this is who Lowndes has on their roster returning. Had some great seniors last year, but they're still loaded. Carson Page, he's a Georgia Tech commit. Tate Sermons, Ole Miss. Noah Thigpen, Troy University commit. Jordan Hudson, Tennessee Martin commit. Ashton Bowler, Valdosta State. Nate Slaughter, Thompson University. Eli Willis, Thompson University. Braden York, Gordon College. And then they also have uh, sophomore Matthew Kerrigan, he's an Auburn commit, and Kaysen Fletcher, a Mercer commit. They are absolutely loaded. Uh, the core from 2023 all return, giving Coach Page a strong group to go for a repeat. Troy commit Noah Thigpen um, had a strong offseason, looks even better. He will be their go to guy. He was pitching in all the big games uh, to lead them uh, throughout their playoff run. He is their ace. And then Valdosta State commit Ashton Bowler will follow Thigpen, giving a consistent arm that will give the offense a chance every time he takes them out. Auburn commit Matthew Kerrigan is a new addition for Coach Page this year. He's going to play a pivotal role in their bid for a repeat. And then they also have a third starter um, at the mound with Kerrigan joining the team this year. So currently... Lowndes is 5-1 and one, uh, in Region 1. Uh, their only loss was to Richmond Hill. They ended up winning that series 2-1. Uh, to one. They are 16-3 and three overall. And currently, they have a two-game lead on second place Camden County and a three-game lead on Colquitt County and then a three-game lead on Richmond Hill. Uh, the only team within the region to beat them. So Lowndes is completely cruising in Region 1. All right, as for Region 2, currently you have Westlake at the top. They are 2-0, and and then Carrollton, they're at 2-1, and and then Campbell. They've had a great season so far, but they've lost two straight. They've dropped to 10-8, and um, but they have a chance to pick themselves back up in the region. They've only played three region games so far. They are 1-2. They're currently sitting at number three in the Region 2 standings. And you also got East Coweta and Pebblebrook uh, fighting for a potential playoff spot. All right, so let's go to Region uh, 3 in Class 7A. Uh, North Paulding is in first place. They've won three straight. They're unbeaten at 3-0. And then Hillgrove is just one game back. They're five and one in the region. And then you got Harrison and Marietta uh, in a fight for that number three seed. So let's see when North Paulding is going to square off with. Yeah, they will have Harrison tomorrow night to start a three game series. If they win that one, they can lock up that top seed. All right, in Area 4, now Brookwood's having an incredible season. Uh, they beat Walton. They've had a ton of top 10 victories. 
um, but they still have to contend with Parkview. And Brookwood did themselves a huge favor last week when they swept Grayson, uh, putting Grayson's playoff um, chances on the line. They're currently in a tie with Newton for that number four spot. You got Parkview at 6-0, and and then Archer and Brookwood are both 5-1. and Grayson has already had to play Parkview and Brookwood. Uh, those weren't successful series for them. But if they can beat Archer and Newton, they can still earn a potential two seed. It would be tough for them to get past Parkview, just being in a four-game hole at this point. But if Parkview is able to beat Brookwood, Archer can get some wins. Uh, Grayson can still um, get a high seed in the playoffs. Let's look at Parkview real quick and their big time players. So they got Cade Brown, a Georgia commit, Thorpe Moosey, he's a Georgia Tech commit, Ethan Finch, Kennesaw State, Adrian Jimenez, VCU, Ford Thompson is a Mercer commit, John Holcomb, Southern Union commit, and then Makai Buckley. A Wallace Dothan commit and Case and Gleaton. A Walt sorry, a Wallace Dothan commit. Those are just the seniors. They're juniors. They have Porter Bearman. He's a Brown commit. Eli Pitts, a South Carolina commit. And they are really cruising right now. They're the highest ranked team in the state of Georgia. Leading the Panthers is senior third baseman and Georgia commit Cade Brown. Uh, he returns after his junior season where he hit 14 home runs and batted 486 at the plate. Newcomer, uh, senior shortstop and VCU commit Adrian Jimenez brings above average tools on both sides of the ball and slots in nicely to fill the hole left by 2023 first round pick Holland, sorry, Colin Houck. Uh, he's also obviously Parkview's quarterback. Another strong all-around profile returns behind the plate and Kennesaw State commit Ethan Finch who will be looking to improve a strong junior season and will be the leader for the Panthers this spring so both those teams are completely loaded and that would be a heck of a rematch um, after last year and as we mentioned each each program Lyons and Parkview added a new piece this year that's also able to uh, start in the pitching rotation. All right, so in Class 6A, Houston County is the defending champs. Uh, they are considered number three in the state of Georgia, regardless of class behind Parkview and Lowndes. But as we mentioned, they already split games with Lowndes, and they are rolling right now. So they have 22 returning players from last year. Tons of pitching depth coming back, and they are improved defensively and have a lot of experience. Eli Stevens, he's a Mercer commit. Kai Decker, another Mercer commit. Carson Small, Pensacola State. They've got a junior committed to Mercer with Ethan um, Buffone. And then Vic Gann in the outfield and Will Allen at first base and pitching. Uh, the Bears have been one of the powerhouses in the state of Georgia for the last several years. They had a special season capped off last year with a state championship led by Drew Burris and Andrew Dunford. Their seniors this year have been starters for three years now, and they have the experience to lead the way. Mercer commits Eli, Kai, and will lead the offense. Both are two of the most consistent hitters in the state. Uh, so Houston County is looking for a repeat and they are cruising in class 6a right now all right let's look at let's look at this region five in class 7a real quick so this one is um, still very up in the air walton opened as the highest ranked team in the statewide power rankings they are ultra talented but they have had uh, a tendency this year to drop some games in these two or three game series they've not been a team that you'll often see sweep in all three which indicates maybe they have two solid aces maybe the more 
um, offensive minded, but they're now tied within the region with Cherokee and Kennesaw Mountain all at four and two. And you got North Cobb at three and three. So you got four teams right there, all very much uh, in the running for a region title. Uh, and then North Cobb defeated Walton. This was on Saturday, seven to three. And so that put North Cobb just one game back on Walton. All right, in, <clears throat> in region six, on the baseball side, you have four teams all at four and three in region. South Forsyth, Lambert, West Forsyth, Forsyth Central, and then Denmark. Um, you also have Milton just two games back. And so this is a very interesting region at this point. You only have two teams that have winning records with South Forsyth at 10 and nine, West Forsyth at 11 and five. West Forsyth is the only team that's been ranked um, for at least half the season, Lambert has re-entered some of the polls, but then they lost two straight, so they're back out. And then for Cy Central, they've won three straight, and so they are uh, fighting for their playoff lives. Uh, you'll have a big matchup tonight between West Forsyth and uh, Milton. Milton's lost three straight heading into that matchup, and it comes on the heels of West Forsyth's three to one win over Milton last weekend. All right, in Region 7, uh, North Gwinnett is in a tie with Peachtree Ridge and Duluth. They are all unbeaten in the region. And then Norcross is at 4-1, and one, just one loss. And then you have Discovery, Meadow Creek, and Burkmar all at 0-6. So you have three teams that are undefeated, a Norcross team with just one loss, and then the rest of the region looks like they're out of it. Um, but that one is still very much in the air. And you'll have Norcross and Peachtree Ridge. And that will be tonight. If Peachtree, sorry, if Norcross wins that one, they now have the edge on Peachtree Ridge. And they're back tied for first uh, with North Gwinnett and Duluth, which will be also tonight at 6 p.m. So after tonight's games, you'll have just one team uh, in the driver's seat for the top seed. And then in area eight, um, Buford has a lead on the entire pack. They are 12 and four overall. They've won eight straight and they lead Collins Hill um, by a game. They are five and one, Buford six and zero, oh, and then they have a three game lead on everyone else. Buford beat Parkview, only in-state team to do that this year. And once again, they do not lose three game series. They might lose one game. Uh, they will, they are very solid in a three game series and they bounce back very strong. Uh, this last week, they had a eight to nothing win over Mill Creek. That's the type of pitching I'm talking about. They only gave up three hits and they put up, yeah, it looks like they scored one or two runs in every single inning of that game. Then you're going to have a central Gwinnett at Buford. That will be on Wednesday um, after they kick off this series tonight. So Buford has a chance pretty much to gain even more space in their region standings heading into uh, the final three weeks of the season. All right, so currently in these uh, standings, hold up one sec. Let's look at how the rankings will shake out. All right, so you have Buford, and my rankings will come out on Thursday, and these are the prep baseball report. I think their first ones came out last week, but they got Brookwood at number three. They moved up from number four. North Gwinnett moved up to number four from six. You got North Paulding at five. Walton slid because of that loss uh, to Kennesaw Mountain. Sorry, to North Cobb, 7-3 loss. They slid to number 7. Yeah, Marietta is at number 8. I mentioned they've had a tough stretch, so I might have them a little lower than that because they're currently number 5 in the region. And then Harrison um, earned number 10 this week. 
in Class 6A. Uh, this poll has Etowah ahead of Houston County. Um, I definitely am going to put Houston County number one. Etowah last week, as you remember, they lost 13 to three to Kell in non-region play, and then Blessed Trinity ended up uh, defeating Kell two days later, and they came in at number five this week, and they actually dropped a spot from number four in this poll. Then in Class 5A, you got Cartersville number one. GAC remains red hot. Uh, they've got one of the longest win streaks in the state. They moved up to number three. Uh, Ola started the season 10-0. They've run into some tough matchups, but they're still at number five. They fell from number three in this poll. In Class 4A, Stars Mill uh, continues to be number one. They are in a loaded Region 4 with LaGrange, who comes in at number four this week. And then um, Region 8 has a bunch of teams in here. North Hall. That's the team that had to forfeit their first seven wins of the season, but it's not impacting them in region play. Uh, their fellow Region 8 opponents, East Forsyth, they come in at number six. And then you got North Oconee, Walnut Grove, and Cherokee Bluff. So Region 8 has five teams in that top 10. And then number 10, Walnut Grove, actually beat number two, Cherokee Bluff. All right, in Class 3A, Defending state champ Harlem is the only, I think the only undefeated team left at this point. And they famously won the state title last year. They're an Augusta school. They were like 32-0. and 0. They lost either their final game of the regular season or second to last game and then just swept their way uh, to the state title. So they haven't skipped a beat. They're still undefeated and leading uh, Class 3A. You got Pickens. Uh, moving up to number two uh, this past week, uh, Peach County has fallen in my poll, uh, but they remain number five in theirs. And then you got Franklin County um, also on a big win streak. In Class 2A, North Cobb Christian and Mount Perrin are outpacing everyone. Uh, Redden, sorry, Redan only has one loss. I think they're on a 12-game win streak. Then in Class A Division One. Uh, Charlton County, uh, this is their second week at number one. I still have Side County at number one. And then you got Baconton Charter. Uh, they are on a 12 game win streak. And then finally, Class A Division One, Prince Avenue Christian uh, leads the way. They won their first ever boys state title last year and returned pretty much everyone and lead Pepperell. Irwin County, and then Tallulah Falls comes in at number four. Uh, they have jumped significantly in the past week. So a team that's not getting any mention is in Class 3A, and that is uh, Gordon Lee. So they're not in uh, this week's poll, but they started the season 0-7. They played a bunch of 7A schools, some higher opponents, but they've won eight straight games and they've won state titles before. So I think Gordon Lee is a team to watch for this week in those 3A rankings. Uh, but those will be out on Thursday, and they will come after a busy Wednesday schedule. There's 160 games. There's some big matchups tonight, obviously, and then Tuesday. So stay tuned for that. Uh, that's it, though. We'll be back tomorrow with Underrated and Overlooked at noon. And then, um, let's see, I think we'll have lacrosse rankings out on Wednesday soccer tomorrow and some more breaking news. So thank everyone for joining us today, and we'll be back then. What you doing? Hey, just finishing this claim to get Dave back on the road. Nice. I wonder what Dave's doing. We've got you covered.